Welcome to the seventh episode in a series where I'm trying to make high quality PCBs using a cheap CNC router. Well, if you're interested in making your own PCBs, then I think you clicked on the right video. With any luck, you're about to see me succeed in making a PCB that comes very close to the quality of a manufactured PCB. Admittedly, this process does take some inspiration from other similar videos on YouTube, but as an end-to-end -end process, what you will see here is likely a first, I think. Of course, there's also the possibility I'll just get sick of trying to figure out how to do this and end up ordering a PCB from China anyway. Hang around to the end to find out. Now for the first couple of tries, I did not do a lot of filming as it seems pretty pointless really. Other than using the silkscreen method to coat the boards, pretty much everything follows what you saw in the prior episodes. So that's what it looks like straight after the first laser burn. I'm a little bit suspicious that some of these tracks are a little bit too thin. But that's what we're here to figure out. I might just etch it anyway just to see how it goes. So here we go, there's the other side of the board that I've just done. I don't know if you can see it there, but this one doesn't look that bad, but I just think that maybe the way that I've set up the layout is just going to burn a little bit too hard, make those tracks a little bit too thin, so. So after cleaning, you can clearly see that a couple of those tracks on this side at least have been blown off. So that means that I'm just pushing it too hard. It's possible also that I'm just pushing a little bit too much temperature. I've got the laser running a little bit too hot for this style. And on this side here as well, it appears to have clung on there. So this is going to be a fail, and that's as expected. But I'm going to etch it anyway, just to see what works and what doesn't. And I thought I'd better give you a look at how I've got this arrangement for etching the double-sided. I've got these little spaces, I guess, or whatever stands, for the board to sit on so that the etchant can flow, on both, flow around both sides. I think they'll do the job, so we'll see. Okay, so I just got through etching that and it's better than I thought I was going to get given what I'd saw with the laser burn. You can see quite a few tracks have just disappeared but there's still quite a lot of tracks that have made it as well. So I think really the setting I was using was really pushing the edge. Amazingly on this side, look at these tracks, you see those? I reckon they've got to be 0.1 mil. I'll measure it a little bit later on the microscope but yeah I mean these survive so it's not impossible it's just that it's right on the edge of possible which is you know I guess what we're trying to find. So I'm thinking if I go around about maybe 1.5 times the thickness, hopefully I'll be able to get away with it. Obviously I want to be able to slip some tracks uh, between these pads like I've done here. So that's where I'm really pushing it. But if I can achieve that, then I'm going to be happy. Yeah, that's going to be that 0.1 mil, I think. Or is it point? Yeah. Somewhere between 0.1 and 0.15, but pretty close to 0.1. Let's have a look at the other side. Let's see if we can measure the thickness of these tracks. This way is a little bit thicker, right? Well, that's probably why it survived, because the resist is burnt. So somewhere between 0.15 and 0.2 there. Yeah, it's just these uh, disappearing tracks here that really kills it, right? But I think I only lost two tracks. I thought I'd lose a few more tracks, but I think I've lost basically two. This one here that winds around the back here. So after checking with the microscope, I noticed that all of the features on this board are about 0.05 millimeters undersized compared to the original design. So for now, I will brute force this problem and simply increase the size of the features in the design itself, and that should make up for the loss. Basically, I'm hoping that this will make the features a little bit more robust and stop the tracks from being blown off by the laser. So let's give that a go. So here we go with the second attempt, as you can see. I've already burnt it and I've silk screened a second layer of UV resin. I ended up actually making a little bit of a mistake. Uh, I was going to make the track width of the power rail thicker and I managed to somehow mess that up. But it doesn't matter. It looks pretty good and amazingly all of those tracks seem present. In fact, one of the tracks looked like it had delaminated the UV resin and I thought it was going to disappear, but even so, the, the track there at the top there remained. So it's not perfect. I'd say it's around about 95% the way there. I think it looks pretty good. So next up I'm going to try and burn in some slots for the silkscreen text and see if I can then wipe in some white resin. I'm not feeling that confident which is why I decided to keep going and if this is a fail I, I might try for a third one and fix up those small errors on this on this board. So there it is, it looks like it's a bit of a fail, 
uh, some of the tracks have been blown off. So that could be a combination of having too much power or possibly the font is too small. Maybe reducing the power would do the job, I think. Seems to be. You can see these are like blown right off there. But I'll code it up anyway and we'll take a look. So in the end, to test the rest of this process, I did take this board mostly to completion. And as you can see, the white embedded text is again a total mess. In truth, this is an even bigger mess than you see here. There was heaps of white resin stuck to the surface I had to clean off. It really took ages. Anyway, this process continues to be a real hassle for me. I think for the next try, I will change the setup so the laser burns on the inside area of this text, and not on the outline like you see here. I think that should give a better result. And as this new resin coat is clearly thinner, I will also drop the laser power from 50% down to 25%. And finally, after embedding the resin, I'm going to use the same G-code path one more time and run the laser over it, using a reduced power of around about 1.5%. I'm thinking that this will make the text cure just enough so that it allows me to clean off the surface of the board without disturbing the white text. Now given what we saw in the last episode, it all sounds a little bit like a recipe for failure, but as this time I'll be using this fast curing resin, I'm hoping we see different results this time around. Anyway, you don't know if you don't try. I also cleared off all the pads with the laser using my original power settings. And just as with the text, we see the laser again is way too hot, with most of the pads detaching from the board. So it's pretty much at this point that I finally got it right, just how critical the role is that the thickness of the resin coat plays. To put it in a nutshell, as this is a much thinner coating, all of my original settings I had figured out are pretty much useless now. Anyway, thankfully this is a one-time problem, and as the silk screen will now always provide a consistently accurate thickness, it's actually a blessing in disguise. Anyway, to clear the pads in the next try, I will reduce the power from 40% down to 25% and see how that goes. I'm really just guessing here, but hopefully it will be in the ballpark. I'm also going to try a different pattern to clear the pads. Up until now, I've been using a spiral method that clears from the center to the outside, or vice versa. But I'm starting to think that this method actually causes a concentrated heat buildup at the center of the pad. Naturally, that's bad. For the next try, I will clear with a simple outline combined with lines drawn across the entire surface of the pad. I'm thinking that this path will probably stop any focused heat buildup, and maybe even allow for better heat dissipation. And as the lines are always burnt in the same direction, that creates a little pause before drawing the next line. So that's also going to definitely reduce the pace of heat buildup. As for burning the etrusive layer itself, I will also drop the laser power from 50% down to 40%. I'm pretty sure I could probably lower this a little bit more, but as 50% mostly worked fine for this little test board, I prefer to play it safe with this setting for now. In addition to that, I'm also going to give more attention to the path of the laser as it clears the resist, try to be a little bit more scientific, and properly take into account the precise amount of resin that is being cleared by the laser. Really for all boards I've been making up until now, as I've noticed any undersized features, I've simply been manually changing the design to solve the problem, basically fudging it. But this is the absolute wrong approach, and a terrible idea I picked up from someone else's YouTube video. So to create the burn pass, I've been using a beam width setting of 0.05mm and no overlap. And typically this resulted in the features being around about 0.05mm undersized. I guess for features of 1mm or so, losing 0.05mm is not so significant. But as we start to close in on features that have a size of 0.1 millimeters, clearly losing 0.05 millimeters is going to start to be pretty significant. So what we're actually seeing here is that the laser path is effectively writing 0.025 millimeters inside the line of the feature as it burns. So as we were configured to expect 0.05 millimeters burn width, it is easy to deduce that the actual beam width is more like 0.1 millimeters. We can also know that even though we have configured for no overlap, we're actually getting around about 50% overlap, right? And as that amount of overlap is working pretty good for us here, we want to try and maintain that, I think. So the fix is super simple. I will simply change the settings to use a beam width of 0.1 millimeters with a 50% overlap, which is pretty much what it actually is. With this, we will be able to get feature sizes that pretty much match the actual design, and we no longer need to mess around modifying the standard element sizes. So that's a pretty good outcome. And following this more precise approach, I also wanted to come up with a system to set the track widths and gaps so they make a much more neater burn path. Looking at the last G-code, you can see that sometimes the paths sort of overlap, and sometimes there's even a bit of a gap between the two paths. Under the microscope, you can actually even see that this tiny line has been left as a result of that gap. So these tiny little deviations do have a real impact on the outcome, be it too much power being applied in one area, 
or unwanted leftover resin lines as we see here. So let's fix this by coming up with a system. As you probably know, electronic chips and other parts originate their dimensions and pitch from the inch system. Now as most of this stuff was originally invented in the US, it's not really surprising really. So the typical dip chip has a leg pitch of 2.54 millimeters or a tenth of an inch, and a surface mount SOP chip has a leg pitch of 1.27 millimeters or a twentieth of an inch, and so on. Now I'm pretty sure there is some metric stuff out there too, but sadly there's no escaping the inch size pitch. For my recent PCB designs, I've decided to stick with a 0.3175 millimeter working grid, and this allows me to make some pretty tight designs while still keeping an orderly and manageable layout. So with this 0.3175 millimeter working grid in mind, let me explain the new rules that I'm using to set the size of my track width and the gaps between them. So the first rule is the track pitch must be a multiple of the working grid. In our case, the 0.3175 millimeters, right? And the second rule is the gaps must be a multiple of 0.05 millimeters and have a minimum size of 0.15 millimeters. And the third rule is the resultant track width must be at least 0.15 millimeters. So the reason for the first rule should be pretty obvious, right? It always ensures the tracks will fit easily within your working grid. And the second rule ensures that we always have nice evenly spaced burn paths, no more weird gaps or overlaps, and a minimum of two burn paths in every gap. This rule should also be applied for clearance gaps when generally filling an area of a board. In my case, I use 0.2 millimeters, which gives four evenly spaced burn paths. And finally, the third rule really just combines the first two rules, but by also capping the minimum track width, we are guaranteeing a reliable result during the etching process. So let's take these rules and explore a couple of examples to see how they work. So something conservative first, let's go with a 1.27 millimeter track pitch with a 0.25 millimeter gap width between each track. And that's gonna give us a track width of 1.02 millimeters. And it passes all the rules and of course, no problem to etch something like that. Next up, let's try the extreme side of things. Let's go with a 0.3175 millimeter track pitch and a 0.15 millimeter gap. And that's gonna give us a track width of 0.1675 millimeters. Again, passes all of the rules and what we have seen so far shows we can reliably etch this too. Now, as I'm explaining this, I'm wondering if everyone out there finds this degree of resolution for a DOI PCB as amazing as I did. Maybe it's just me, but let me put it this way. Using a track pitch of 0.3175 millimeters gives us just over three tracks every millimeters. Or in bananas, that's like 80 tracks every inch. Anyway, looking at the theory of that was a big wow moment for me. So next up, my third try, let's see if we can make that a reality. I've already resin coated these double-sided PCBs in advance and also added some masking tape to protect it while cutting and filing. To chop up the blank PCB, I'm using my mini bandsaw. If you don't have one, then a hacksaw will do the job. I then knock off any sharp edges with a file. Doesn't need to be perfect. For now, I'll just remove the tape from one side, lock it down in the CNC. This board is so tiny that two of my small clamps will do the job here. Drill the locating holes. I also deburred these holes with a 10 mil bit. Burning the front side resist pattern goes smoothly. Flip the board to the other side. Use the locating pins to relocate the board. On to burning the back side of the resist pattern. There's really only a couple of traces here, so it doesn't take very long. Let's get it off the CNC and take a look. The burn on the front has come out pretty nice. I can't see any defects as such. And the rear also looks fine too. Clean off any burn residue with some IPA and a fine toothbrush. I fix my cute little etching stands. Actually, I made them a little bit too small, so I'm using a rubber band to stop them from falling out. I like to warm up the etchant in a boiling water bath. This seems to speed up the chemical reaction quite a lot. I also scrub the etchant into all of the traces with a fine toothbrush. And as you likely saw in episode 5, I now use the CNC in combination with the UV Exposer's rotary base to get a good agitation. Pop all the stands off during the first stage water wash, and then do a final wash in some clean water. And the result looks really great on both sides. Now I've noticed that dust is really the enemy when doing this silkscreen work. So I'm using a bit of tape to ensure that the board surface and the silkscreen is always very clean. I always start by manually pushing the resin into the surface first and then use the rubber spatula to evenly cover the surface. Next up, UV exposure. 
And of course, repeating the exact same process for the other side of the board. The result's looking pretty good so far. Something on the bottom margin of the board there, but I don't think that's going to be a problem. Again, using the locating pins to line everything up, you can see that that one particular pin is really sticky. And now for the big challenge, trying to get the white text descriptors to work. Here we are burning in the slots to embed the white resin. It doesn't take long to complete. Now I'm purposely doing the cleaning and embedding of the resin without actually removing the board from the CNC. I'm scraping off as much of the residue as I can and also at the same time checking to ensure that all the slots are filled properly. You can see there is still plenty of resin on the surface. It's got me a little bit nervous. And I need to work quick here since this resin cures pretty fast, even under normal lighting. So here we go with the IPA cleaning folks. Hold your breath. Maybe okay. Let's get it off the CNC and take a closer look. Now tell me you don't like that. Come on guys. This is amazing. But I'm going to stick it in the UV exposure for a little bit longer, maybe 30 seconds, and she'll be locked in. So I already cleared the pads on the back side of the board using the 25% laser power setting. And just so you know, I always do the laser cutout for the PCB right after clearing the pads. Nothing new to mention in that process. It's exactly the same as you've seen in prior episodes. After clearing the rear pads, I thought I saw a little bit of residue. So I thought I'd try to pump up the power just a little bit to 27.5% when I do the front. Sadly, adding heat was a bad call. Later on when I was working with the board, one of the tiny 0603 resistor pads actually just fell off. So after cleaning with IPA, you can see here that the pads look good, just checking by eye. But this pad here seems to have some type of residue. Under the microscope, we can actually see that these are tiny lines of resin that have remained on the pads. The lines are of course at a 0.1mm pitch, which matches the clearing operation that I've been using. Actually, it's really easy to knock these off, so it's not a big problem in that sense. I also feel a subtle washboard effect when I'm running the cutter knife over the pad. So the laser must be eroding a tiny bit of copper when it's clearing those pads. Looking at this ground pad here with a naked eye, actually it just looked like there was some sort of slight green tint. But under the microscope, we can actually see that it's entirely covered by these tiny resin lines, a lot more than we see on the other pads. This is a result of the ground pad being able to dissipate heat much better than the other pads. If the copper surface remains cooler, then the adhesion strength of the nearby resin is maintained. This again clearly shows why managing heat levels in the copper surface is critical to getting a good result with this clearing operation. And forgive me while I go off topic here for a second, but I wanted to point this out while we're still looking at these tiny 0.06mm wide resin lines. Looking at this, we get an insight as to what the maximum possible track pitch might be using this resin and CNC laser method. Already with my current method, I'm reliably getting just over 3 tracks per millimetre right? But what we see here on this pad is actually 10 lines per millimetre, nearly three times that. Of course we need to get the laser power levels just right to achieve that. And on top of that, you would want to add some safety factor to keep the resist relatively robust. But even with that, I think we can see that a pitch of up to 5 tracks per millimetre may in fact not be a stretch at all. Now don't get me wrong, 3 tracks per millimetre is already insane, and definitely covers anything that I'm planning to do in the short term. But still, at the same time, it's nice to know that we have a little bit more of our sleeves, should we ever need it. Alright, let's get back on topic. I think this lines method for clearing the pads is giving a better result than we saw for the spiral one. Even so, I still feel that we haven't really achieved the perfect result, and that this method really requires more changes to get it working right. So next time, I will change the settings to properly take into account the burn width we are seeing here, and I'll also make sure there is some degree of overlap on the burn path. I will also change the laser power from 25% down to 10%. Now that's a huge drop in power levels. But even so, we will be spending nearly twice the time clearing each pad, meaning the total heat will only be reduced by a little bit. In fact, there's even the possibility that the pads don't get fully cleared in one pass. And if that is the case, then I'll simply clean the board and run the operation one more time. The net effect is that clearing the pads will likely take either two or four times longer than it did take here. But it doesn't really matter. The operation is already pretty quick. And I don't really mind to wait a little longer, as long as the pads are cleared and undamaged. Here you can see I've added a new alignment action just before drilling the holes in the pads. 
After doing the XY probe, I then manually move the mill to one of the pad's coordinates and check the alignment. I then make small adjustments until the bit is perfectly centered, taking note of the amount of adjustment as I go. This amount is then used to correct the position of the origin, and then I send the mill back to the coordinates of the pad and make sure the alignment is now correct. It's a little bit fiddly, I know, but it's definitely worth it. And you can see, as a result of this, the holes on the front here are pretty much now perfectly centered with the pads. And by the way, I'm using a new 0.7 millimeter mill for these holes. This is slightly smaller than the 0.8 millimeter mill that I was using in the prior episodes. Sadly, if we look on the rear side of the board, we can see that the holes are a little bit off center. Mostly in the X axis, it seems. Probably more than acceptable as it is, I guess, but my OCD won't cope with this for sure. Actually, at first I had a little bit of a hard time understanding why we were seeing this mismatch, but then it finally hit me. The origin of the laser and the mill are still not being perfectly aligned. And the result of that is that the locating holes are being drilled out of position with relation to the laser's origin that I end up using. Now if this was just the y-axis it probably wouldn't matter that much, but any mismatch on the x-axis is doubled when we flip the board. And that pretty much explains why we see such a big shift. But there is some good news, we can see that the amount of error remains consistent just by looking at these holes on the backside here. So put simply, if we can get this alignment perfect, the problem should go away. I will definitely try to improve that for the next PCB, so you'll just have to wait and see for that. Snapping the board out with the long nose pliers is easy enough. Likely this will be even easier once the front and back laser alignment is improved. File off the edges and get rid of all that charring. Another round of cleaning in IPA. And voila, the PCB is now complete. Personally, I think the result looks spectacular, but clearly I'm biased. Love it, hate it, or just meh. Whatever it is, just leave it in the comments. Next up, let's try to populate this sucker and see if it even works. I'm going to try and use this new lead-free low temperature solder paste. I've never used this before. I think I saw the seller demonstrate applying it in this method, but actually I don't really know what I'm doing. Placing the SOP chips first, 1206 components next, now these 0603 resistors really are tiny. And finally these 0805 red LEDs. Actually I noticed these LEDs have a tiny little green dot on one side to identify the cathode. That helps out a lot. And that's it. Now I'll turn on the hot plate and we can enjoy the magic. Ah, that's looking really bad. So instantly we have two obvious problems that we can see here. The first is there is simply too much solder paste. The second is, is that these pads are not really taking up any of the solder. So for the first problem, next time I will cut out a mask with the laser and CNC and place it over the board and apply the paste. That should allow me to control the location and the amount of paste on the board. I'm pretty sure that's going to solve the problem. The second problem, however, I really need some time to think about it. Actually, in episode 5, I'd already noticed that it was sometimes difficult to get the pads to take the solder, but this experience finally confirms it's a real problem. I suspect that burning the resin off the pads with the laser is causing some type of chemical reaction on the surface of the pads. Specifically, I'm thinking that copper is probably oxidizing, but I'm not really a chemist, so it could be something else. I know that rubbing it with flux and hot solder solves the problem, so clearly the damage is only skin deep. So I really need to find a good way to clean or treat these pads before trying to solder to them, especially with solder paste like this. I'm currently thinking a vinegar soak and or using metal polish might do the trick. I know there's a product called Liquid Tin that I've seen other people use and that might do the job, but it's super expensive, super dangerous, and maybe even impossible to get here in Japan. Well, at least I can't find it yet. Anyway, if anyone out there knows a simple and safe way to pre-treat these pads, then please let me know in the comments. Now I was thinking of using my little toaster oven trick to recover this disaster. If you want to know what that's about, then check out episode 5 of my electric motivation series. I think that method works pretty good too. But since we are dealing with just a handful of components here, I'm just going to bite the bullet and manually solder them on the board. I've already pre-tinned the board and will now install these L-style wires. Solder the top first, snip off the excess, and then solder the back side of the board. Time to place all those components back on the board. For the SOP packages, I always solder one side before doing the other. For small packages such as 1206, I will try to get the soldering iron to bridge the gap. And at the same time, I'm also applying some pressure from above to get the component to settle down into position. Here I'm applying the heat gun to get everything to float into place. 
and removing the solder from one side of these LED pads with the solder braid, this makes it easy to get the components to sit down flat. And once I finish soldering the LEDs in place on one side, I then follow up by soldering the other side. Give it a scrub with IPA to get all that nasty flux off. Now one of these 0603 pads has decided to abandon the board as I discussed earlier, so I'm adding a little bit of a bodge wire here to fix the problem. Now finally adding the power leads. Let's power it up. Oh, well, this is nothing but a minor miracle. Look at that, working fine. First time. Different to the board I made in episode 5, I now have the LEDs running in the opposite direction. Oh, actually, this was just by accident. I wasn't giving it much thought when I laid out the board. Other differences to note is the fact that I changed to a common resistor instead of having a resistor for every LED. I also changed the resistor value to make the LED shine a little bit brighter. And finally, I changed the 555's RC value so that it runs a little bit faster too. You can see the board comparison shows the new board is only about a quarter of the size now. Sort of cool to see, but it's not really a fair comparison given the content of the boards is quite different. And really, either of these boards could be laid out in a way to make them much smaller in any case. Now, I really want to share the techniques I'm using in this series with others, but as I don't do social, well, I do YouTube, I guess that's sort of social. But anyway, the point is, my options are limited to share this stuff. And as my channel is pretty tiny, I can guarantee you that YouTube's algorithm won't be giving me any love. So it's really up to you folks. If you watched the video and you found it interesting or useful in some way, then please do hit that thumbs up button and possibly even consider leaving a comment. Apparently all that stuff still stimulates the YouTube algorithm to some degree. Anyway, I have a bunch of projects and video ideas in the pipeline. Not really sure what will be coming up next, but I do hope you join me. So see you then.